Perhaps Perry just a little bit. <laughs> I think so. See, what Terry does, he reverses his age to 57. That's why he's still playing pickleball. All those fun things. Now, he looks great. Might look like Terry is 75. I'll be lucky. Amen, brother. <laughs> Mark Judy, thank you so much for leading us in such a beautiful night. Of work. I don't know about you guys, but uh, we got a couple more families leaving, and this is kind of our summer crowd. So nobody else leave. <laughs> Why you stay here? <laughs> but uh, it's a uh, it's an interesting thing through the summer that we just keep going and keep teaching, and we're going to be able to serve them out with a really great thing because we actually record the services now and you can see it on Facebook or on YouTube and so you can kind of stay with us a little bit where we're at and going. We've been, we spent last three weeks going into Good Friday and, and Resurrection Sunday and so now we're going to jump right back into the Beatitudes and Sermon on the Mount and some of those areas where we, we, we've been at in the last few weeks and as we're when I first started this series, I was kind of doing it in a way of just going to preach through Mark, but that hasn't worked out so well. Because as I'm going through Mark, I'm like, oh, no, I can't miss this, and I need to talk about this, and we need to go through this. So we're just kind of going through the Gospels. We're going to just kind of wade our way through and see how that goes. But I want to pray as we start this morning. Father, I just want to thank you for this body of believers. Thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I thank you that we're a family. I thank you that you've rescued each one of us and put our faith in you and you brought us into the kingdom of your love and your light and that we're a part of the families of God. And there's a day coming when there's going to be a great celebration at the wedding banquet of the Lamb. And, and Lord, I can't even imagine how awesome that's going to be and the power of the worship and the meal and just celebrating all that has happened through, the, through time. And Lord singing this last song about how big you are and yet you're, you can fill us with your love and your presence in our heart. And I think of that scripture where it says you can measure the whole thing in the palm of your hand, the universe itself. And yet you love us intimately and personally. And so I just pray today that you'd open our hearts to your word and the power of your word and the things that you have for us to grow in, to learn what it looks like for us in 2019 to live a life out loud for Jesus in this culture and this time in a way that would make people want to know you more. So we just pray for our hearts to be open, for the Spirit of God to come, that you work in us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in Matthew chapter 5, so if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. Uh, just real quick, we're going to go back and just look at a couple things. Jesus is in the Sermon on the Mount where he began his ministry, he's come. And a great light is gone, and the valley of the shadow of death, and all those kind of things are going on. And so the kingdom of God has come. The king has come. And I just want us to keep that in our heart and our mind. The king is here. And as he goes up on the mountain, because he has so many multitudes, he begins to teach them. Remember when we looked at the Beatitudes, which I like to call more of what Jesus called, but what's, what is it going to look like? What's going to take for you to be a part of my kingdom? That's what I think. But he starts off, remember, he said, Blessed are the broken, poor in spirit. The one, theirs, for theirs is the kingdom of God. There's only one way in. When you realize your spiritual poverty, when you realize that you've been separated from God because of your sin, when you see that finally and understand he's the Savior, that's an entry point, right? And when I first came to Jesus, that's what I always talked about. I, I shook so, so much that I couldn't even kneel. I laid flat on my face. But Jesus saved me that day. I was different from that moment on. And it, and it goes on through, and I'm not going to talk about all of them, but it, it talks about the mourning and the mercy and all everything that happens, the peacemakers and all those things. Jesus is talking about, this is the kind of person or people I am looking for, people who understand their need for me that they can't, they don't have, and they can't ever make it to heaven on their own righteousness. So Jesus is upsetting the culture that is based on self-righteousness. He's upsetting a culture, a religious culture, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and you look at the zealots that are, could be either Pharisee or Sadducee, you've got the scribes, various theologians from different camps that are all teaching what it looks like to be someone who's following God, and that culture had gotten really upside down with their ideas of righteousness. But 
We do it all the time. From the day I gave my life to Christ, I went from being free and knew I was forgiven to walking into a church that taught me a certain grid. I started to think I had to go, I got to go, I got to go, up, oh, uh, man. And then all of a sudden everything went inward instead of keep my eyes on Jesus. And Jesus is the only one that can perfect your faith. But he's stepping into a culture here of people who believe they're God's covenant people. They're of Abraham. They're, they're of the covenant. They're, they're God's people. And I don't know that we fully grasp that, but if you walk into enough different kinds of churches, you're going to get a good feel for what this is. And I look at this culture, and Jesus comes into it, and just, you know, four weeks ago we talked about that Jesus didn't come to abolish the law, but to what? To fulfill it, right? And he says, not even an iota, not even a comma, not even the least mark in the law it will be erased. Because the law's purpose is to be that tutor that we talked about, to lead you to Christ, to show you that you are guilty, that you can't fulfill the righteousness of God. You can't be perfect, because that's God's standard, perfection. You have to be perfect. You read, James 2.10 says you break one part of the law, you're guilty of the whole. So it's leading us to a Savior. It's leading us to the Lamb of God, the one in whom it was promised in Genesis, who would come, the seed of the woman, who would crush the head of the serpent, and he'd come and be, behold the Lamb of God that John talked about, who takes away the sin of the world. So Jesus comes into this culture, and remember when we were talking about this passage, I talked about these, this group called Antinomians, who are anti-law, they were so sick of the Pharisees, and the way they were making laws upon laws, that they went completely to the other extreme, right? And there's people within those camps where they just, man, they thought Jesus is they were excited about Jesus because he'd come and, and it looks like man, he's, he hasn't done what the religious do. He doesn't look righteous in the way that they look righteous and holy in the way that they call holiness. It's all the traditions and the sacramental washings and cleansing and everything that they did. He was doing it different. And he was calling people to a different way. His way. The way it brings life, right? And in there you had all these different groups, so you had the anti-law people who started to get excited and, and, and they were thinking, man, maybe, maybe finally we're going to have a, a new way that we're free from all this stuff. And then, then the Pharisees started getting excited when he started saying, I didn't come to erase the law, but to fulfill it. And, and he starts talking about this stuff and they're starting to get excited, but he just kind of blows the lid right off at verse 20 where we're starting today because he says what? Chapter 5, verse 20, he says, after saying all that, they got to go, maybe, maybe, and then he says this, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you'll never enter my kingdom. So it's like he just reached right out and went, you think you're righteous. You're not. This verse should make us all so fast. Think about what Jesus is talking about here. You know, as I've entered the Sermon on the Mount and I'm looking at this message that Jesus is giving to this culture, Jesus already knew the hearts of men, didn't he? He knows the culture in which he's talking to. He knows he grew up for 30 years in this culture, in this system, watching, observing, going, oh my gosh. They've never understood. Everything about them was external. Everything about them was superficial. Everything was about how they looked and keeping their little rules and, you know, Making everything, everybody, we got to be in the same camp here. And we're not going to stir any waters. And Jesus came in and he more than stirred the waters. And he punched them right in the face here. So do you think it's safe to say that everything else he has to say in the Sermon on the Mount is directed towards it? I think very much it is. Often I've looked at the Sermon on the Mount. We look at it as a Sermon of Ethics and, you know, maybe morals and all those kind of things. And, of course, it's touching on some of those things, Right? But he's after something more. He was after the heart of the religious people of the culture, the religious people who thought they were God's covenant people. He's not surrounded by a bunch of Gentiles here. He's surrounded by all Jewish people and Jewish leaders and religious leaders and scribes. Why do you think he's calling them out? They're standing right there. And he flat out looks at them and he, he might as well just say, you're going to hell. Because isn't that what he says? You're damned because you think you're righteous. You don't even know me, but I'm standing right before you. <clears throat> Woo! Pretty heavy. It's really heavy. But he goes on in here, and this is what I love. 
as we get into this, one of the questions I asked as I looked at the messages in here is, you know, he picks out two of the commandments, right? He picks out what? Commandment on murder, thou shalt not murder, and thou shalt not commit adultery. Then he picked out a few other laws and different things throughout the Levitical and Moses writings, and, and he goes after them. And so I was looking at this and I wonder, why these two laws? Why these and not others? Why not, you know, some different laws here? But he, he the commandments, he picks two specifically. This first one hit me hard as I began to think about it and look at it. But listen to what he says in verse 21. He says, you have heard it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And they would all been going He didn't stop there. You know why? One of the things I realized as I got into this text this week is one of the reasons he teaches on this first because they claim he know the law, right? So he starts talking about the law and he jumps right into the, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. Because he knows ultimately what's going to happen. Have you ever thought about that? He knows ultimately this is what's going to happen. This is what you're going to do to me. You think you're doing it for God. He ultimately knows that inside that they're they're dark and they have a lot of anger, bitterness, and malice in their heart. They, they're trying to protect their religious system because they have authority and power. If they do what Jesus says, their power and authority is stripped away. It's not about power and authority, it's about being a servant. Right? So Jesus is going right after their heart, right in the beginning. And it fascinated me as I dive into this because you know, he's saying, you've heard it said. So what he's saying is, you've heard it said. You, you, you study this in your local synagogues every week. And they're all going, well, I haven't heard it anybody. I don't know. I haven't heard it. And then Jesus gets personal. Right? If you're sitting here today, you might be like, well, I haven't heard it. But I've hated it. I've been really angry before. To a point of, Anybody else? He goes on and he says this. It says, you, it says you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Then he goes, but I say to you, so now he's doing something, and this is important to understand their culture, because no teacher, no rabbi taught in his own authority. So Jesus just stepped out and did something that is, I'm telling you right now, that when, did he say, but I tell you? Nobody did that in culture. They taught from ancient rabbis who come and then say ancient rabbi so and so said or teaches, and they all went from those grids. It's kind of like our denominations today. Huh? We all have a little grid, little things we go through. Jesus come back and he would upset our world too. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to what? Judgment. Ooh. 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 You know what he's doing? He's digging in to the deeper recesses of their heart. You might not have physically murdered somebody, but you have murdered people in your heart because of the way you hate and the anger. You think the culture was full of hate and anger? They were captive by Rome. They hate Rome. They hate each other. They hate other religious groups. They're full of anger and hate. And we see that in the culture. If you study the history of all, of all the anger and hate that is in this culture. And then there was no mercy. None. I mean, remember what we've been studying? That those people who were sick and diseased were considered, what, cursed by God. They treated them as such, right? They didn't have mercy. They had no compassion. There was no love in their heart. And that's what Jesus is trying to show them. You don't have love in your heart. And I love this. Everyone who's angry will be with his brother will be liable to judgment. Now, brother here doesn't mean physical brother. It doesn't even necessarily mean spiritual brother. It, he's talking to Israel. He's talking about all Israel at this point. Every person or human. Other passages funny, it talks about, it uses the word neighbor, right? Love your neighbor as your self. Your neighbor isn't your brother, but he is your brother, your human brother. 
right? So understand, some people have tried to justify, well, that's not my brother. <laughs> yeah, good luck. <laughs> it is your brother. He's your fellow human being, created in the image of God, right? But he goes in here and says, so if you're angry with your brother, brother, you're liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the fires of hell. <laughs> you think he's trying to pick a fight here? I think he picked it back in verse 20, didn't he? Or I tell you, unless your righteousness pass out of scribes and Pharisees, you won't ever enter my kingdom. They had to have been speechless for just a few moments here, right? And then he gets right into the heart of what he's after. See, clear back in the Old Testament to the New, God's always been after what? The heart of a person. See, right actions, and we've got to be really careful with this, because it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have right actions, right? We're not talking about that. We're, we're talking about if you have the right heart, it should be reflecting in how you actually treat your brother, how you actually speak about your brother, how you actually uphold your brother, versus... Because <coughs> what did Jesus say when he teach that what goes into man doesn't pollute the man? What comes out of him speaks of one's <laughs> heart, right? Have you ever been in trouble with this? I mean, if we're honest, I mean, this is one of the things that I look at and I look at these things and I think, oh my goodness, if it wasn't for the love of God, I'm, I'm a dead man! <laughs> right? One of the greatest evidences in, in our life, when you look at the first, I look at verse 22, I just want to cover it again. When you look at says you're liable to judgment if you have anger towards your brother. And, and he goes on and he tells us some specific things to do. But he tells you if you insult your brother, I mean you're tearing down his character, what? You're going to be brought before the Sanhedrin or the council. And then he goes in the end and he says if you call you you fool, literally you're, you're cursing him, saying you're not even, you have your empty headed dummy, literally, you're not worthy of anything. And you pronounce a curse on that person, you're not even worthy of life. And God says you're liable to hell. He, then he goes on. He says some things here that I think are powerful. He says this. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Have you ever asked why? I mean, I, I just want you to think about something. How often do we have an issue with somebody that we don't resolve? Now, some issues, resolving them just requires you, right? Every time I've had a bad thought towards somebody, it doesn't mean I have to go tell them I have a bad thought. I've had people that do that. Oh, Pastor, I had a really bad thought. I'm like, what? Tell them. I don't want to know. Just that's between you and the Lord. Take care of it, you know? I mean, because we all have them, right? You don't have to let them have you, but that we all have them. And but there's some things because something happened in the relationship that's that's hindered that relationship. And, and so either bad words were said, or maybe you did something you shouldn't have done, or whatever it was. Maybe you puffed yourself up and made them look bad. And you've never done that, have you? Or made yourself look good and somebody else look bad. I mean, think about it. I mean, you really need to go back and make a man is reconciled. Isn't it interesting that God could care less if you're sitting here today if you have people like that in your life? He could care less that you gave him the offering. Because that's not what he's after. He's after the heart. And then when you give, it means something. It's actually worship. And then when you sit here and sing and praise the Lord, it's actually worship. But if we have an issue with somebody, it says, go make that right. That's real worship. Worship isn't singing in and of itself, is it? You know what I can sing freely like we did this morning is when I know I have a clear conscience and a clear heart with God, right? And a clear heart with my fellow mankind, everybody that I can possibly. It's not okay. So what Jesus is after, and I just want you to think through this a little bit more, is he already knew what they were saying about him. 
Darren knew the anger that was rising in their heart. Over and over and over, we'll see things like they went out from there and planning how they might kill him, arrest him, stop him. All you got to do is go against culture a little bit and actually live in truth. And you'll start experiencing things you didn't think were possible. Like, why are they mad at me? I didn't do anything to them. You did the right thing, they did the wrong thing, so they're mad at you. That happens all the time. But Jesus is attacking and he's talking to them about the condition of their heart. And I tell you what, he's concerned about the condition of our hearts today. Right? He goes on and says, Come to terms quickly with the accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser, what, hand over to the judge and the judge to the guard? And if you put in prison, it says, truly I say to you, you will never get out until you pay the last penny. I always wonder, um, this ultimately is a picture of hell here at the end, okay? You think in Judgment Day, for those who didn't live out their faith and didn't do the things that we're called to do, do you think your accuser would be there pointing the finger at you? I think probably. It's redeemed by the blood. Covered, right? If you've repented, if you've yielded your life to Christ, that's the good news of the gospel. Jesus says, confess your sins, he's faithful and just, to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But what I found in my life, and if I could just be really honest about it, is I found there were certain things that God called me to go back and make right, and there are other things that were just really personal things that I had to make right with him. But when I do that, I'm free. My heart is set free. I want to talk overall and just spend a few moments talking about this whole issue of anger. I think it's a big deal today. You know, Jesus confronted one of the biggest deals in his culture right off the bat. He the whole issue of anger. He, he might not physically be murdering somebody, but he's telling them, you're murdering them in your heart. You're murdering their character. You're murdering them as a human being. In the way that you tear them down. If we're really honest, we're really honest, it's really hard for us to realize that I'm not any better than anybody else. Now don't misunderstand me, that doesn't mean my behavior should begin the longer I walk with Jesus. It should be lining up with who? Jesus, right? I should be loving the way Jesus loves. I should have a heart that cares about people. And a story I want to share with you before I get into some verses that I'm going to talk about when I first got saved, before I first got saved in high school, I had a good friend. He's a minister today. And he'd tell you the same story. We didn't like each other at all. I got saved, and he got saved, and guess what? He's absolutely, unequivocally, one of my best friends. We talk every other week or so on the phone. He's in ministry as well. Encourage one another. But do you understand the miracle of that when you go from Really not liking each other. I mean, really not liking each other till we get saved and all of a sudden like, man, I love you, brother. Do you understand the miracle of that? Can I just say that without the Spirit of God, without being born again, that it's impossible to really love people and not be angry at? Can I just tell you that anger in and of itself isn't a sin? But if you let it have you, it is. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about anger a little bit deeper. I want to go through this. Romans 13, we're going to look at some verses together. This morning. But I always look at the epistles as kind of really goes a little bit deeper and tells us more of the teaching. But in Romans 13, verses 8 through 10, this is what it says. And, and the greatest thing, the greatest miracle that happened to me the moment I gave my life to Christ, when I got off the floor that night, I immediately, it was like scales fell off my eyes, and I looked at people differently. You know why? Because the love of God came in me. And also, I actually really cared about people and not just about me. So, listen to what it says, starting in verse 8 of chapter 13, Romans says, Oh, no one, anything except to love each other. Huh. For love, it says, For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Isn't that amazing? Love the Lord thy God, my heart, soul, mind, strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Now, loving your neighbor as yourself. Isn't as easy as it sounds. 
Some neighbors just want to irritate me. <laughs> right? Some neighbors gray neighbors. Some people gray neighbors. I call them sandpaper people. <laughs> and you know what I don't like about this? Is that God uses that for me. To knock off my references, to knock off my selfishness, to knock off my pride, to knock off and open my eyes to realize that all the different types of people are what God created uniquely. And when you can learn to love, really love, and see the good in people, your life changes. You can't help it. And he goes on in here. It says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That means when your neighbor wrongs you, you forgive them. Why? Because don't you want to be forgiven? Forgiveness is the greatest weapon on this side of eternity. Forgiveness to set your soul free, but forgiveness to set others free. Forgiveness is the greatest witness because people look and say, man, how did he get through that? How did she get through that? And they see peace and love in your heart instead of anger and bitterness. Right? It goes one way or the other. You can't. There's no middle road here. You're either you can say to yourself, I'm not angry, I'm not bitter. The heck I'm not. <laughs> right? I said that in the next one. But anyway, <laughs> the truth of the matter is, what I'm trying to say is, you're better off to say, Lord, I'm angry and I'm bitter. You've got to help me or I'm in trouble. Because it's in that that God can come and work in your heart. It goes on in here. It says, Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling the law. It says it again, right? Besides this, you know the time and that the hour has come for us to wake up from our sleep. Because the coming of Christ is closer than we know. That's what he's talking about. So, man, you better get your heart right. You better get your eyes fixed back on your Savior. You better get your vision back in the right place. Remember why you're living. Remember why he saved you and redeemed you so you can be that witness. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 2 8. I just want to look at a few scriptures here. 1 Timothy 2 8. I was on Timothy and I, I switched right over to this one. 1 Timothy 2 8. I just love this because it, listen to what it says. This is Paul speaking. It says, I desire then that in every place, the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. I just thought it was funny to be pointing out men here. I think one of our biggest issues, guys, maybe some of you guys, but especially guys, we struggle with anger. Anger, pride, and lust. Three big, big things for us. But anger is a big issue, and, and one of the things I've learned in my life is I had to admit that I had anger, and I had to ask God for help. I was raised in anger. My dad was angry, right? You've heard some of you heard me share. My dad was the most angry man I ever met. I, I was starting to become the most angry son anybody knew. So the chip doesn't fall too far from the tree, right? Or the nut too far from the tree, as they say. And the moment I got saved, God just broke into me. I didn't really get delivered from it until I was 20, two and a half years later. I got angry one night, fell on my face, after punching a hole through the door. Anybody ever do such a thing like that? I might be the only one. <laughs> fell on my face and he said, Lord God Almighty, you got you to help me. I'm in trouble. I got anger in my heart and I can't get it out. I don't know how. You know, I was on that floor for probably an hour. Tears and sweat, literally. I, I mean, I, it's like I was in a wrestling match. There's a spiritual battle going on I didn't understand. A stronghold that God was breaking in my life, but I didn't understand. But when I got off the floor that day, it was done. That doesn't mean I can't be angry, right? Anger's an emotion, but it's not out of control. Has it ever been out of control since that day? A couple times. But not really. Not like that. God is so good. I just want to encourage you. 
Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. I just want to show you a few things here. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 26. Listen to what it says. I, I think this is just so helpful. Because I, I heard for a long time, if you're a Christian, you can't be what? Angry. Scripture doesn't teach that. Listen to what it says. Be angry and do not sin. Huh. You know why? Because anger is an emotion God has given us. Anger can make you do something you need to do. It can get you proactive where you need to pro be proactive. But it also can be a raging fire that destroys everything in its presence, right? It says, be angry and do not sin. And I love this. It says, do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why? And he says, give the, no opportunity to the devil. If you let the sun go down in your anger, you have a health from a fish. See, the enemy loves to make us angry because anger, if you let the sun go down on it, gives him opportunity to get a grip in your life, which can begin to cause a root of bitterness in your heart. Anybody ever experienced that? Because I have. And some of you have heard me say it, but my grandma Erickson always said this weird saying to me that I never understood until years later, but he said, she always said, Danny, you got to get the root out. You can't you keep chopping it off, son. And I was like, Grandma, you're nuts. What are you talking about? She was absolutely right. I didn't understand it. I thought I was dealing with it by mowing it down. It only was dealt with when I really got real with God and let him come in and literally pull the rest. In my own strength, there's some things I can't forgive, but in his strength, I can do all things. Do you understand that scripture means a lot more than I can physically go to work and do this job today, even though it means that? It means a lot more because it read it in context, it's talking about spiritual warfare, it's talking about battling, it's talking about standing for Christ, it's talking about all those things. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, meaning in the midst of this, hurt. I can forgive this person whether they, we ever have a relationship or not, right? There's some situations that you can't go back and have a relationship with. But you can forgive them let God remove that room and heal your heart. And it transforms you. That's what makes you child of God. That's what makes you full of His love and grace. That's what makes you have mercy on others. Do you understand what I'm saying? Somebody looks at me and says, well, you just don't understand. You're a pastor. I says, oh, wow, man. <laughs> I can tell you some stories to make your hair stand up. Unfortunately, I'm a human being like everybody else. I walk through the dusty highways of life like everybody else. I experience the same pain, same hurts, same struggles, same temptations, same sicknesses, same diseases. This is everybody. But I'm going to tell you. I hope it's in Jesus. Right? So it goes on in here. And I think the biggest thing that I want to share with you before I move past this, and I know I'm running out of time already, but the biggest thing I want to share with you, this like, leave an anger in your life when it says not to give a devil an opportunity. I've seen people who have let anger be in their life when the sun went down and it stayed in their life. And the enemy has got a grip. And guess what? When you get angry and bitter in there, you have to one thing, and it, it, it reflects all over everything, right? And it can destroy you know, quicker than you imagine. But it goes on here, and I love this. Verses 31 and 32 of chapter 4 of Ephesians says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with malice. They, they all fit together, because when you get angry, this kind of stuff starts coming out of you, Right? It says, be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That is a key to all life. If you don't understand that you're forgiven in Christ, you won't be forgiven. In the Orange Prayer that we say often, it says, what? As we forgive those who trespass against us, God the Father forgives us. But it goes on in there and says, if you don't forgive those who trespass against you, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you your Trust passage. You know why? All that is showing is you've never really understood. You never really. If you've been born again in the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in you 
gives you the same mercy you receive to give to others, right? If you don't have that, you got to question yourself and ask why. Now, listen. Something horrific happens to you in your life. There's a process of working through those things, right? Don't let anger happen. And if that anger rises up, the feeling of anger, that doesn't even mean that anger has you. But you'll still keep going to the Lord with it. Say, Lord, you've got to help me in this. If you don't help me, I don't have a chance. For that. I don't have a chance. I can't forgive this person in my own strength. And it doesn't ask you, is that marriage? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm overcome by the blood of the Lamb. I'm over, I haven't overcome by my own sweat, my own trial. Greater is he who lives in me than he who is in the world. I'm not doing this on my own. I have received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who comes from God, that I may understand what God has freely given me. What does he give me? New life. Complete forgiveness. Clean slate. So as Jesus is coming at them really in love because he's trying to shake them. Say, I know your heart. Because if you spend time in Matthew 23 where he talks about the seven woes, they're all directed to the outward righteousness of the Pharisee and then talking about the inward darkness that is captured there. And when Jesus was pushing these buttons, instead of repenting, they got more and more angry. Some repented, right? Praise God. I know none of you men have been like me, but my wife says, why are you so angry? And usually when she says that to me at different times, I'm not angry! <laughs> what? You tell. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, brother, <laughs> Lord have mercy on all of us, right? Amen. And I want to end with this verse, John 13, 34, 35. And this is Jesus speaking to us. It says, a new command when I give you to be the what? Love one another. Why? By this the world will know you're my disciples if you love one another. So you must love one another. Oh Lord, would you stand with me? Father, we pray in Jesus' name that the power of the Holy Spirit would come. And Lord, that you would fill us with the love of your presence. And Lord, we confess that in and of ourselves I cannot love to that depth. I can't let go of those hurts. But in Christ, strengthens me, I can do all things. So today, as we are looking at this issue of anger, Lord, I just pray for each one of us. Lord, would you examine our hearts? Holy Spirit, would you come and search us? Would you reveal names, circumstances, situations, people? <coughs> Maybe we've just been cutting it off and not dealing with the road. Lord, this week, would you speak to us and help us to allow you in the deep recesses of our heart to do spiritual surgery and that you begin to uproot any root of bitterness, any unforgiveness, or that we begin to deal with those things, that we might be full of your love and grace and truth that the world would see the reality of the miracle of Christ in us. Lord, have your way. Bless my brothers and sisters in Christ today. Encourage them, strengthen them, fill them with your love and grace and truth. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.